This UCSD TV program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest programs. Why space dust is so special. Exploring nanomaterials with x-rays to improve their performance. How drought, fire, and flood shape Mediterranean climate ecosystems. Understanding the ecology of California's vanishing valley oaks. And sustaining California's agricultural heritage into the future. All on this edition of On Beyond. I'm an astrophysicist and I study um, the interstellar medium in galaxies. That is the gas and dust that exist between the stars. I think dust is one of the most fascinating things in astronomy. Interstellar dust is really nothing like dust on Earth. Dust on Earth can be, you know, very gross things actually, like dead skin cells and hair and stuff like that. We think that there are two different types of dust that exist in space, carbon-rich dust that's more like soot, and then silicate-rich dust, which is more like sand. But the dust particles in space are actually much smaller than dust that we would encounter on Earth. The grains are, are tiny. My favorite kind of dust is actually a type of dust called polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. Polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons are rings of carbon with hydrogens attached on the outside, um, and you can build up multiple rings attached together um, into different structures. When they absorb a photon, their little carbon skeleton vibrates in specific ways, and that vibration can then emit a photon. When they emit, it tends to be in the infrared, so it converts this energy into infrared photons. Sometimes when a polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon absorbs an ultraviolet photon, there's enough energy in that photon that kicks out an electron. And this is just a matter of probability. If it kicks out this electron, this electron heats the gas in the interstellar medium. And that process is called the photoelectric effect. A lot of my work has been observing those features in the infrared part of the spectrum that come from these vibrations of polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. These microphysics are very important because they set the temperature of interstellar gas. Interstellar gas exists in this turbulent state. There's all kinds of variations in density and temperature. There's all of these factors that influence how interstellar gas is organized, but these microphysics of dust are what set the temperature. Dust shields the cold, dense regions where new stars are forming. But if dust wasn't there, the UV photons from other stars would be able to go into these regions and break up the molecules that are necessary for the cooling and collapse of gas into new stars. So what I do is I make maps of nearby galaxies, looking at the infrared light from dust, and I use that to infer how much dust there is and what it's made of and how it changes depending on where you're looking in a galaxy. There's an array of telescopes called the Atacama Large Millimeter Array in Chile that allows you to see extremely fine detail in the distribution of gas and dust in nearby galaxies. I've been using ALMA to try to understand how dust and gas interact in the small Magellanic Cloud. This is a really cool galaxy. I also really like the Andromeda Galaxy, another neighbor of the Milky Way's. It's quite a bit further away. 
and a bit older. I think what captures my imagination about studying the interstellar medium and dust is that it's a very complex system with a lot of different parts. It's a lot more like studying, I think, climate. It's trying to understand a complicated system, and that really appeals to me. I think it's also interesting because it's so fundamental to how galaxies work and how planets formed and how eventually we got to life on Earth. I just finished my PhD in physics here at UC San Diego. I work in Oleg Spirko's group. The primary focus of our group is to use an X-ray imaging technique to study what goes on inside nanoparticles. And the reason that we're interested in nanoparticles, if you imagine that this is your particle here, is that you have a lot of volume to surface area ratio for bigger particles, like say the things that we're used to in everyday life. And what this means is that the shape of this particle doesn't really matter for how it interacts in various uh, processes. Now, as you start to shrink this to the uh, nanoscale, so you can see that as it shrinks, the surface area actually becomes a bigger, uh, relatively larger to the amount that's enclosed in the volume. And so we use this to exploit uh, the fact that nanoparticles that are, say, shaped like cubes or like uh, uh, diamonds, they actually behave differently for many relevant processes, including you know, the charging and discharging of batteries, uh, the catalytic activity, say, in carbon dioxide reduction. And so this is a very important uh, idea that we can use to tune the properties of particles uh, to do the things that we want to do better. And so we do a lot of initial characterization here at our lab in UCSD where we have a normal lab x-ray diffraction source. That basically lets us figure out the quality of our samples. So do we have particles that are all the same shape and size? Uh, are, the, are the atoms well ordered in these particles? Then we go to a user facility, a, a synchrotron source outside of the Chicago area. And this is one of these big uh, rings that basically is used to produce a very special type of x-rays. And we need these special type of x-rays to see inside what's happening in these nanoparticles as they're in the battery charging or discharging or as they're in catalyst, uh, catalyzing the reaction. Now what we can see inside these particles is we see not only their shape, so we can tell if they're spherical or if they're cube or pentagon, for example. But we also see how the atoms on the inside are displaced from their equilibrium positions. So we call this the strain. And so we can see how the strain changes depending on what's happening inside the nanoparticle. The most exciting thing for us is that in perhaps 10 years or so, we're going to have these upgraded synchrotrons that have an even better source of uh, x-rays, which we can use to peer at even smaller particles. So right now we're limited to about uh, 20 nanometer particles, although for some more realistic applications people are going as low as one nanometer, which we can't image yet. So with these upgraded synchrotrons and this very special technique, what we hope to be able to do is build better batteries, better catalysts, uh, make strides in hydrogen storage, and really try and make better devices for uh, relevant uh, technical challenges that we face today. In the world's five Mediterranean climate ecosystems, rain is fickle. The twin specters of drought and flood are always on the horizon. These regions receive the majority of their precipitation in the five or six months around winter. Hot, arid summers tend to parch vegetation. Dry conditions dramatically raise the chances of fire. Yet rainfall levels in Mediterranean areas can fluctuate tremendously across a single wet season, as well as from year to year. Big swings in precipitation set the stage for drought in some years and flood in others. All three of these forces, 
drought, fire, and flood are major influences on Mediterranean climate regions, shaping their ecosystems, landscapes, and human communities. Of the five Mediterranean climate regions, California and central Chile experience the most rainfall variability, both within the course of a single year as well as from year to year, and almost never receive summer rain. By contrast, the Cape region of South Africa and Southwest and South Australia get showers even in summer. These differences have affected the ecology of each region. The dry summers of Mediterranean climate regions put water stress on plants. Plants across all five ecosystems have adapted to drought in often similar ways. Many have hard, waxy leaves that reduce water loss. Such sclerophyllous leaves can maintain their shape even as tissues dehydrate. In addition, the seeds of native plants are often programmed to remain dormant until after soils have reached a minimum moisture level. This helps ensure germination occurs during the wet season. Because rainfall in Mediterranean regions is so seasonal, streams often stop flowing in summer. Others only run during storm events. As a result, stream mouths can get disconnected from the sea for months. Aquatic species native to Mediterranean areas have adjusted their life cycles to this pattern. Coho salmon, for example, lay eggs and migrate to and from the ocean only during the wet season. Providing enough water to support Mediterranean region cities and agriculture can be challenging. Demand for cooling and irrigation water is greatest in summer, exactly when supplies are lowest. A dry landscape and dry vegetation turn every Mediterranean summer into fire season. Fire has played a major evolutionary role in shaping most Mediterranean climate ecosystems. Fire-related plant traits include root crowns that re-sprout after fire, and seed-bearing cones that open after experiencing high temperatures. Seed release and germination after fire allow seeds to sprout on bare soil instead of competing for light and nutrients with mature plants. The exception to this rule is Chile. The height of the Andes blocks most summer lightning storms, limiting ignition opportunities. Sparse vegetation due to human landscape changes and the lack of hot, dry summer winds also help limit fire risks. Humans have altered natural fire cycles in a number of ways, both intentionally and unintentionally. In California, for example, native people have traditionally used fire to clear underbrush for many reasons, including to open areas for hunting and promote the growth of edible bulbs. In the modern era, people have made fire more frequent by igniting accidental blazes with machinery or cigarettes. At the same time, humans have sought to suppress fires to protect homes and property, causing a buildup of fuels in many areas. Altering a habitat's fire regime can trigger dramatic vegetation changes. Frequent fires can convert former shrublands to alien grasslands because native shrubs don't have a chance to reproduce. Suppressing accidental blazes to maintain relatively natural fire cycles can help preserve native chaparral, fanbos, and matoral communities. Fire can also be used as a management tool to give native plants an edge. For example, many chaparral wildflowers such as penstemon and metilaha poppies are stimulated to germinate by chemicals in smoke and ash. Burning helps such plants renew their populations. 
Rain follows every hot Mediterranean summer, sometimes in torrents. Where fires have left landscapes bare, soils are more easily eroded by the impact of raindrops, and runoff carries away even more sediment. Mud flows can be very destructive. Runoff and flooding also increase where fires have caused the formation of hydrophobic soils that resist water infiltration. These consequences of fire can drastically alter the shape and condition of streams, encouraging floods and creating dangerous conditions downstream. But rain also rejuvenates dry and burned landscapes. Its return each year continues the ancient cycle of drought, fire, and flood that have such a large role in shaping Mediterranean climate ecosystems. My name is Kyle Funk. I work for Walt Canning here at Hastings. We're studying the reproductive ecology of valley oaks, and we're sitting here under a valley oak that has a bunch of catkins out and uh, should be dehissing pollen into the wind willy nilly soon. <laughs> we're trying to understand oak tree reproduction more thoroughly. In most years, they won't produce very many acorns at all but in some years they'll have these huge bumper crops of acorns and those years are called mast years. The question of how masting occurs is important for conservation of valley oaks, which are not regenerating fast enough to replace themselves. So this is the phenology survey. Um, phenology means timing of life history traits. I visit each tree in our population once a week. I have a good look at it through the binoculars. I see what proportion of the buds have opened up, if catkins have come out and how many, and kind of what stage they are in uh, releasing pollen to the wind. Here's a kind of a group of catkins. Each one hanging down is a catkin, and these are the male flowers of the tree. You can see that dust coming out, and that's all pollen. So each tree produces both male and female flowers. All right, so these are two valley oak female flowers right next to each other. And these turn into acorns once they're pollinated. So some pollen grains have to reach the little axle of these leaves and pollinate these flowers. Yeah, ooh, here's some nice female flowers. Another part of the project is we operate these things called pollen traps. And um, we put it up on a hill so it would be in a windy area. It sucks in air at uh, 10 liters per minute. And so everything that's in the air gets impacted onto this adhesive on this wheel. We try to do this quickly because the time when we're changing out, we're not collecting data. These get chopped up into 24 hour portions and turn them into a bunch of slides that are later analyzed. And this is telling us how much pollen is in the air and when are there peaks in pollen abundance? And so it's all related to oak tree reproduction. Here we go. So Walt and his collaborators have been collecting data on acorn production for a really long time. So they have, they have this massive data set and so far the data suggests that when the trees release pollen into the air relatively synchronously, that leads to a good acorn year. We're not sure at, at what level these trees are not uh, reproducing themselves or why. Their theory is that it's herbivores that are making it harder for them to establish themselves. But it's important to understand all aspects of the process. The more we know about their reproduction, the better we can conserve this habitat.
It's one of the oldest industries known to man, and in the age of modern technology, it's still one of the most crucial to our existence. But while agriculture used to mean plowing the fields and caring for the cattle, today it involves much more. Farmers are educated people these days. They have to be. Rich Rominger just celebrated his 85th birthday alongside a whole family of farmers. Six generations of Romingers have been farming this land just outside of Sacramento since the 1870s. Well, we'll start some fields harvesting in about four to five weeks. And as you can imagine, a lot has changed within that time. Aside from farming all of his life, Rominger has served as California's Secretary of Food and Agriculture and as Deputy Secretary at the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. He's also a graduate of the nation's leading agriculture school, the University of California, Davis. His was the class of 1949. Now, when I went to school there, the only thing on the Davis campus was the College of Agriculture. So it wasn't until later in the 50s when it became a general campus. A lot of people in the urban environment don't really know that the fact that the pastas and the salsas and everything they get are all tomatoes that started at UC Davis. The next section Rich's the sons, and Bruce and Rick, cycling. also attended UC Davis and followed in their father's yeah. footsteps, including maintaining a strong relationship with their alma mater, the research university that started literally as the satellite farm school for UC Berkeley. At the time, it was considered a risky, innovative idea born from students themselves. Over time, the student farm evolved into a major public research university, the University of California, Davis, and has since produced many leaders in the world of agriculture and many innovations that have changed farming as Rich Rominger used to know it. Well, this is an example right here with the tomatoes because Davis developed the mechanical harvester and also bred the varieties of tomatoes that could be mechanically harvested. The mechanical tomato harvester, invented at UC Davis more than 30 years ago, really was a game changer. Farmers used to hand pick tomatoes. This machine enabled them to cover an acre of plants in just a half hour. While it replaced human labor at the time, it also led to a boom in tomato production, eventually employing more people than before and making California's Central Valley the epicenter of tomato processing. UC Davis has, has been an incredible driver of the economy of California through its innovations in agriculture. And most of the crops that we grow in California have as their origin discoveries at UC Davis. Neil Van Alphen is the former dean of the College of Agricultural and Environmental Sciences at UC Davis. Chardonnay and Merlot. But he grew up in California's Central Valley and understands the challenges and the changes farmers are facing today. In fact, he farms his own 20 acres not far from the UC Davis campus. Because the world changes, we have to change. And uh, so that's, that's always the biggest challenge is how do you anticipate uh, what's over the horizon and prepare for it. And Farmers constantly face change. Pests adapt to their environment. Water is always at a shortage. And then there's the weather. For more than 100 years, UC Davis has studied and shaped a healthy, abundant food supply in the most agriculture-rich state in our nation. What many people don't understand is that farming is an incredibly knowledge-intensive endeavor. We are trying to control the variables of nature and produce crops on a sustainable and consistent basis. And that takes a lot of knowledge. And this is where all of that knowledge comes to life. UC Davis operates a market garden, children's garden, ecological garden, and a 300-acre long-term research facility called Russell Ranch. The good thing about using uh, small implements like this is you can kind of move them by hand. It's an education in agriculture that's as much hands-on as it is classroom and research focused. There are courses that teach students everything from plant breeding to truck driving to welding. We try to make certain that everybody who comes through this major gets their boots muddy and their hands dirty, as well as getting the top agricultural and environmental education you can get anywhere. Isaac O'Leary is an incoming freshman. As a Regent Scholar, he's also one of California's top students. He chose UC Davis because of its newest major, sustainable agriculture and food systems. We have better access to food than anyone else, and yet our food system is still completely askew. 
and not to mention horrible food, uh, food distribution issues elsewhere in the world. It's a modern day focus on the social, economic and environmental aspects of food and agriculture, an industry that's made up of much more than sowing the land. It's time for this generation to step up and uh, take control of the food system, I think. So our aspiration is to be training that generation of leaders that will go out, some will be farmers and ranchers, some may go into politics, some will go into public service, journalism, agribusiness, finance, the whole range. I mean, the food system touches so many parts of our lives and of our economy. California agriculture is a $37 billion a year industry, and the Golden State has led the nation in ag production for the last 50 years. And this campus lies in the heart of it all, which makes local farmers an obvious partner for UC Davis researchers. This is Rockland. Um, you know, this is a, a really nice hard red wheat variety. Kent Britton is a farm advisor for UC Cooperative Extension, aimed at enhancing agricultural productivity throughout the state. Yeah, see how white it is and everything. It's just a we decide what works where, when the problems come up, we're the people that solve those problems. Here at the Rominger Farm, Britton was given a five acre plot of land to conduct research trials on wheat. So I'm growing all the latest uh, wheat varieties and triticale varieties to pick out the varieties that are best suited for this type of climate and this, these type of soils. At the end of his trials, the Romingers will harvest and keep the wheat, and UC Cooperative Extension gains valuable information that will help increase yields, decrease pests, and aid farmers and researchers statewide. And so it's, it's valuable for us because next year we'll be planting something that he says, oh, this was a great yield or didn't get any diseases. So we'll take it and we'll plant it next year on a larger scale in our fields. As a young farmer, a beginning farmer, I relied solely on cooperative extension farm advisors. Those Just down the road is Sierra Orchards, farmed by Craig McNamara, who's very active in advocacy as well as education. As founder and president of the Center for Land-Based Learning, he works with UC Davis on teaching youth the importance of agriculture to our society. In fact, he's a UC Davis alumnus as well. So I like to think of it as the three P's, people, planet, and profit. 28-year-old Toby Hastings is one of many success stories that have come out of the Center for Land-Based Learning, where Toby leased land to start his own organic farming business. Free Spirit Farms now provides produce to 40 restaurants in San Francisco, and Hastings pays it forward by working with youngsters who visit the farm. Most of the kids have never been on a farm, and, and they don't really know um, what it's, it's like to be a farmer. Yeah. And I'm able to take them around, show them what day-to-day -day life is like for me, and, and do things like harvest and weed and pretty much anything I'd normally be doing. Indeed, as the prototypical farmer changes, there will be many other changes to farming in the next century. Farmland itself is shrinking, while farming is taking a growing toll on our environment. At the same time, our population is growing too. Experts expect we'll have 9 billion mouths to feed by the year 2050. Nonetheless, students, farmers, and educators say they're optimistic. With a legacy born at this university, the proficiency of the nation's most successful farmers and the next generation becoming more educated and more aware than ever before, the challenges can be met. So what we've got to make sure we do is to continue this student farm as a place where students can try out these wacky, fringy, surprising things that 30 years from now are going to be the mainstream.